When churches fail, it demonstrates the prodigious ability of man to counter the purpose of God. It doesn't demonstrate the power of the devil. It demonstrates the power of man to counter the purpose of God. Only the disobedience and the lack of cooperation of Christians hinders the purpose of God on the earth today. Let me repeat that. It is not the devil stopping the gospel. It is Christians who are not obeying God who are stopping the gospel because Christians can stop the devil. Hello, I'm Pastor Bola Ogini, and this is Passion for God coming to you from Paris, France. We're talking about partnering with God. You know, our lives are only as significant as they are useful to God. And the Apostle Paul was one man who modeled the life of significance, a man who made his life available for the purposes of God. We've been talking about partnering with God. We've uh, looked at so many different aspects of partnering with, with God. What does it mean to partner with God? The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi and commended them for their partnership in the gospel. They, they partnered with him in supporting him financially, but also in, they partnered with the gospel in the, what they did themselves, their commitment. He wrote to them about being of one heart, one mind, and one spirit as they stood together in the defense of the gospel. Every child of God is called to partner with God. Every child of God is called to make his life available for the propagation of the gospel, that the purpose for which Christ lived would become the experience of every human on the earth. We have erroneously thought that we are saved to enjoy the blessings of God. We know we are saved to honor the Lord with our lives. That includes enjoying his blessings, but more than that, that includes using his blessings to be a blessing to others, to be a carrier of the message, a carrier of the gospel. That obsession with the desire of the Father must once again inhabit the church. You know, we've been looking at all these different things that come into play when you want to be a partner. And we've talked about embracing the mission. We've talked about uh, uh, accepting the vision of the local entity you're a part of. And so many different things I will not go into today because I want us to finish this today. We had to stop during the last program. We couldn't finish this particular point. But you see, today we're talking about faith. Faith is an essential component in partnering with God. In Hebrews chapter 3, we read of how the people had an evil unbelieving heart. Let me read it to you. E Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19. Watch out, brothers, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that departs from the living God. And in verse 19, it says this, that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Who are these they? It talks about their ancestors who perished in the wilderness. And you know, there is a story in the Old Testament about those who perished in the wilderness. We started talking about it last week when the spies were sent out by Moses to go and spy out the land which God had promised to give them. They came back, some of them with an evil report, and the other two, Caleb and Joshua, came back with a good report. And we saw the difference in these two categories of people, one category that walked by faith, the other that did not. Unfortunately, the majority and they chose to turn their backs on the promises of God. And they decided that they had had enough. And they criticized Moses. They, they even complained about God himself. And they said, we are going back to Egypt. We are going back. We refuse to follow God's plan. Many of us today know what God's plan is. We know that Jesus has a grand project of bringing the world to himself. We know that Jesus said, go and make disciples of the nations. We know that he gave us a commission and a mission and a mandate. We know that he entrusted his work into our hands. But many of us have looked around and thought it's too hard. You know, the, spy, the 10 spies came and said, those people, yes, the land is good. And we say, you know, it would be wonderful if, if France was saved. How nice it would be if Paris was saved. Can you imagine how great it would be if on Sundays in Paris, you saw people going to church. You know, wouldn't it be nice if my co-workers were saved? Oh, it would be so nice if my husband would be saved and my mother, my father, oh, my sister. Oh, if only my family were born, family were born again. You know, we see. We, we see the destination. We think, oh, it would be nice. And, and we, the land is good. They came back and said, the land is so wonderful, but it's too hard. These people are stronger than we are. 
That is a fundamental principle you must keep in mind. Every time you think that something that God tells you to do is desirable, decide that it is also feasible because it is. It is. And even if you think it's not desirable, decide that it is desirable. You choose to find it desirable and feasible. And so what do we see here? We've looked at the exchange between all these different people, how they complained, how they wept, how they emitted loud cries and how they murmured and lamented and how Caleb and Joshua said, no, we can do it. My question is this, why? Why was there one set of people who did not believe and another set who believed? This is crucial for us if we're going to partner with God because we are not affected necessarily by differing circumstances, but we can see the same situation and react differently. That's what we see here. In our task of taking territories for Christ, we can be in the same territory and one church will be going down, one pastor will be depressed, one evangelist will be fed up and frustrated and another will be taking territories, will be getting people saved, will be reaching their generation. Another church will believe that God will use us to do great things in this land and continue to go ahead. What is the difference? How can you be different? How can you be a Caleb and a Joshua? Listen, they said this and this is the key. I believe that this is the key. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 7, Caleb and Joshua said to the entire Israelite community, this is what they said, the land we passed through and explored is an extremely good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and give it to us. Verse 9, only don't rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land, for we will devour them. Underline that, please, it will save your life. <laughs> Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. <laughs> don't be afraid of them. Verse 10, while the whole community threatened to stone them, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tent of meeting. <laughs> we saw earlier that the, the, the ten spies said the land is great. Caleb and Joshua said the land is great. So there is no difference in the perception of the land. We all think it would be wonderful to get our nation saved, to get people filled with the Holy Spirit, to get people serving God, to bring them out of alcohol and drugs and all kinds of addictions and perversions rife today in our society. We all think it would be good. But some think it's feasible and some think it's not. If you're going to be a partner with God, I re repeat this, you need to believe. Let's take this further. What was the difference? How come Caleb and Joshua were true partners? This is important. The first thing I would say is, is they actually saw the destination. They actually saw the destination in a way. I just told you they saw the same thing. But in seeing the same thing, some people interpreted it rightly, others did not. They, they didn't just see it physically, they saw it. They caught the vision. And you must catch the vision. You must not just look superficially and say, oh, this would be so nice. Something must happen inside of you as you contemplate a nation one for God. Something must happen inside you. They really saw it. They saw it and they embraced it. They embraced the vision fully. They saw it. They said it's an extremely good land. They saw it. They desired it. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church. Can you see it? 
Or all you see is just your Sunday service and we're here, you know, we're just, we're just struggling. We're, we're managing. You know, there's this expression in French among staid Christians. They go, ah, frère, ah, frère, comment ça va? Oh, on persévère, on persévère. You know, it's, it's like, how you doing, brother? Oh, we're, we're just, we're hanging in there. <laughs> we're hanging in there. You know, and, and it's, they use the word perseverance. We're persevering. And it sounds so powerful, but it's not. It's just a mark of defeat. These people can't backslide, but really they can't forward slide either. And, and you know, Jesus said, I will build my church. We should see it. We need to see a glorious church. We need to see the word of the Lord going to the nations, the glory of the Lord covering the nations. We need to see stadia filled with people. One day, many years ago, I was involved in a church plan and I was walking back home and the Lord opened my eyes and I began to see. I still remember this. On that street, on that street, I saw, it was like I saw windows or houses with, with light in them and people in those houses studying the Bible on just a normal Paris street and just saw people walking down the street praying, praying in other tongues, believing God, just a lively atmosphere filled with the presence of God, charged with faith. I saw something that galvanized me and it hasn't left me. I still know that in my lifetime, I will see this nation at the foot of the cross. I will see what we have never seen before in France. I will see it. You know, they saw it. They, they believed it. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. So I cannot see the church being defeated. I cannot see the church disappearing. No, I, I just cannot see the world overrunning the church completely. That's not possible. What are you seeing? They said it's an extremely good land. We must see to the point of being obsessed with it and willing to give up anything for it. They saw what the others did not see. They, they all saw in the natural the good land, but they saw beyond the natural. They saw themselves possessing the land. The second thing that I want you to know, why did they believe and the others did not believe? Because, beloved, to be a partner, you have to believe. God is not going to be pulling you out of bed every day. Say, I know it's hard. Please just get up today. It's, it's, it, try one more day, please. One more day, please. He's not a babysitter. He says the just shall live by faith. It is up to you to build your faith. Why did Caleb and Joshua believe? Because we need to believe. Why did Moses believe? Moses did not have one ounce of a doubt. For him, it was a, it was a given. And then he was blessed with a Caleb and a Joshua for whom it was also a given. I said the last time that if you're a minister today, believe God to have Caleb's and Joshua's around you. There is nothing more, more exhausting for a leader to be surrounded by people who don't believe, who don't see what they see and who certainly don't believe it, who, whose actions demonstrate their lack of faith. So Caleb and Joshua, the second thing, they trusted in the goodness of God. And in the power of God, the two go hand in hand. They trusted in the goodness of God and in the power of God. You see, God is not only good. Many Christians think God is good, but they don't think he's powerful. Some think he's powerful, but they don't think he's good. So they're afraid of him. Oh, God may kill me. You know, we have to believe in his goodness and in his power. What do I mean by that? I mean that as we go around daily wanting to preach the gospel, get people saved, we must believe in his goodness. You see, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If he was good enough to give Jesus, he's good enough to touch their hearts as we preach the gospel to them. We preach, we talk as if we Winning a soul was pulling teeth. Winning a soul was fighting God himself, fighting all the powers of hell and fighting God in himself. I'm trying to force God to get them to believe what we are saying. But it was his idea to save mankind. He's the one who paid the price for us to be saved. He was good enough to send his son. Why will he not do what is required to touch the people we're witnessing to? If we will do our part. 
We have to trust in his goodness. We have to trust in his power, his ability to subdue every power that rises up against his purpose and his will. A church is condemned to succeed. I'm telling you, I tell the people in our church all the time that we cannot fail I mean, it, we will have to be very creative to fail because we are, the power of God is available. We are doing the thing that God wants done. And he's the supreme power in the universe. When churches fail, it demonstrates the prodigious ability of man to counter the purpose of God. It doesn't demonstrate the power of the devil. It demonstrates the power of man to counter the purpose of God. The devil cannot hinder the purpose of God. Only man can, can. Only mankind can. Only the disobedience and the lack of cooperation of Christians hinders the purpose of God on the earth today. Let me repeat that. It is not the devil stopping the gospel. It is Christians who are not obeying God who are stopping the gospel because Christians can stop the devil. Did you hear what I said? Christians can stop the devil. Jesus died on the cross and gave us the authority to hinder him from hindering the gospel. But because we don't obey God, look, look what happened here. They trusted in the goodness and the power of God. What happened? They said, in case you didn't believe me, verse eight, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land. A land flowing with milk and honey and give it to us. Huh. They trusted in his goodness. They knew that it's up to us to be for God to, to do what is required so that he will be pleased with us. It's up to us to honor him. It's up to us to obey him. Be beloved, today it's up to the church to honor the Lord. It's up to the church to believe him. It's up to the church to trust in his goodness. It's up to the church to obey him. It's up to the church to meet the conditions required for revival. It's up to us to submit, to believe, to trust him. They believed in his goodness and they believed in his power. They didn't think the devil could stop them. They didn't think the giants could stop them. They didn't think the sons of Anna could stop them. No. You see, one of the stories I really love in the Bible is the story of Peter walking on water. And what Jesus said to him when he began to sink, it, it's something that's deep inside me. And that just it's one of those things that keep me going, even when things seem to be difficult and I just can't give up. It's not possible. What, the, you know, Peter walked on the water. This was impossible, but he did it. He did it. Why? Because he trusted Jesus. So it's not the circumstance that hinders us. It's our refusal to trust God that hinders us. You know, he walked on the water because he trusted Jesus. And you know what happened? He began to sink because he feared the waves. Not because he couldn't walk on water, but because he feared the waves. And Jesus said to him, why did you doubt? In other words, the circumstances could not have sunk him. Only his own belief sunk him. It's really powerful. No matter what circumstances we face in preaching the gospel today, in taking our territories and our nation for Christ, those circumstances are not powerful enough to stop us. The only thing that will stop us is if we, if we do not trust in the goodness and the power of God. In other words, the ball is in our court. Caleb and Joshua knew that. He said, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will give us the land. In other words, he's good and he's powerful. In other words, he's well able to do this. And that's what they said. I think it's the King James that translates it as, we are well able to go up and take the land. We are well able. The church is well able today to make disciples of nations. We are well able. So he says, if the Lord is pleased with us. So they accepted the promises of God. They desired the promises of God. They absorbed the promises of God. They trusted in the promises of God. The third thing I want to say to you today, if you truly want to be a partner, is that you must be willing to pay the price to fight for the territory. You see, many people think that when we say we are going to do this and we're going to do that, it means it's going to be easy. They're like, one of my precious daughters once said to me, uh, I love this, and I repeat it a lot because many people think that way. You know, she said, but if something is from the Lord, it should be easy, shouldn't it? Yeah, I know. I'm happy to say she doesn't think that way anymore. Uh, that it should be easy. No, absolutely not. 
the, the promised land was of the Lord. He would promised it to Abraham. Over 400 years later, it wasn't given to them on a gold platter. They still had to go and fight for it. And that is precisely what the 10 did not want. They didn't want to fight. They didn't have a stomach for war. They just wanted to go in and settle down. And many Christians are like that today. And that is why the church is capitulating. In many areas, we're capitulating to the culture. We're bowing to the immoral values of our culture. We are just, some of us are playing dead. We don't even want to hear about it. We don't want to talk about it. We're hoping it will go away. Say so a, um, a young boy said to me, he was telling me some of the stuff going on in their school and all of this gender fluidity and stuff and, and all of these new mores that are being imposed on our children. And he was very uncomfortable about it. And I said, oh, I just, hope, I just hope all of this will stop soon. And I said, it's not going to stop soon. It's, it's going to get worse. Uh, and, and many churches are like that. Oh, don't you see, this is too upsetting. <laughs> I don't want to deal with this. I just hope it will stop and go away. It's not going to go away. We're going to get stronger, more powerful more determined. You know, I just wish that we would become troublemakers. You know, we need to have an appetite for war. We need to have an appetite for trouble. I pray all the time. You know, I, in, 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 um, in the book of Isaiah, there's a, there's a verse, and in the Amplified Version, it says, um, the Lord will harden you to difficulties. And the Lord showed me that scripture when I was a young woman who was overly given to emotions, you know, and, and that helped me. And I prayed that over my life. I've been praying that over my life for 30 plus years. I said, Lord, harden me to difficulties. And we need a generation of believers who are hardened to difficulties. In fact, we need a generation of believers who are troublemakers, who just like trouble, you know. The church has become too docile, too too domesticated, you know. Uh, the, the world has domesticated us. We've been neutered. Uh, and so we don't like trouble. We are like the 10 spies. They saw the sons of Vanak. They're like, ah, oh, we don't want trouble. We just want a nice place to live. And we just, we just can't handle this stuff. We, we're going back to Egypt. We just came back to Egypt. We just came back to Egypt. That is how the church is in many places. Believers need to like trouble. Let's get some trouble going. Let's upset some people. Let's annoy some people. Let's go fight for something. Let's preach the gospel when they don't want to hear us. Let's let them get angry. You know, in the early days in the ministry, it used to bother me when people would say really nasty things about me as a woman. You know, some people would say to the members of our church, you're going to go to hell because your pastor is a woman. And I used to think, God. And the Lord told me, oh, wow. You know, and then it's like, does it bother you, bro? <laughs> it's just like, let's go stir up trouble somewhere. Let's just go annoy some people. And, and so these men were fearless. They submitted to God and they were willing to fight. We must be willing to fight. We must be willing to stand up against those who are against what we believe in. They must be willing to stand up against those who don't believe in Jesus. Back in the day when I was still in my profession, every once in a while someone would rise up and say, hey, are these Christians? I, I always enjoy the in your face thing. You know, I, I was never like, oh, God, they're talking about us. I prayed that. I said, Lord, make me bold. Make me bold. So I would face them down. And I would stand up and say, so what is your problem with Christians, by the way? <laughs> I was always very in your face about it because if you are not, they will intimidate you. I know some people, I was never aggressive. Like just go to people like, no, but when anyone would boldly attack Christians, I would boldly defend Christians and always boldly talked about the great things that God was doing. Stories of miracles and healings and deliverances. Oh, we won't believe what happened in church this Sunday. And it broke something. Some people who were believers who were like secret closet believers came out of the closet. And, <laughs> and those who were hostile to Christians before just chilled. Because at the same time, I was extremely nice to everybody. And let me see, and some of, did that make me popular with everybody? No, no, no. I, I had this, I, I met one Jewish colleague once and we took the train together. And she said, you know, you know what people say about you, don't you? I'm like, well, what do they say about me? She says, oh, they, they said that you take this religion thing too far. So praise the Lord. So they know I'm into this religion thing. She said, but I like you. I, I just love being with you because I feel safe with you. 
you know. So what am I talking about here? I'm talking about the fact that we have to be fearless. We have to be bold. We have to be confrontational, not antagonistic. There's a difference between antagonism and confrontation. And I know our dear friends who live in the British Isles, you, you, you people there don't, you're very like, you know, very, very quiet. You don't, you don't like to upset the apple cart, but we are continentals. I, I'm a French woman. I live in France. In France, we are cantankerous, you know, you know, the average French person will get in your face and you, you just, we just like trouble. So I think it's time for, for us to um, de-anglicize Christianity and, and make it more combative. You know, we, we need to fight for what we believe in. Preach the gospel with authority and boldness. And so they were willing. And to this long digression, let us go back to our message. So Caleb said, uh, and Joshua said, we're willing to pay the price. We must be willing to pay the price, whatever it will cost you. They will look at you as cancer at work. They'll gossip about you, say, oh, you know, you know, you know, you know what they say about you? I'm like, what are they saying about me? <laughs> uh, and, you, you know, and, but I, I, I saw people healed. I saw people touched by the power of God. I, I saw people in, I prayed for people in, in, an in, in international organizations and I saw the power of God come upon them. I prayed for highly placed people. I mean, it, it's, it was wonderful in that sense. Also, people didn't like people at all. You know, we're not here to be popular. We're here to be effective. And so they were willing to fight. They were willing to, 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 to submit to God. They were willing to pay the price. He says, only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not rebel. I'm saying to someone today, do not rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land, for we will devour them. Last week we read what the people said, what the, the, the ten spies said. They said they would devour us. Let me try and find the scripture for you. Now, in Numbers 13, verse 31, it says, they said, the, the ten spies, we can't go up against the people because they are stronger than we are. So they gave a negative report to the Israelites about the land they had scouted. The land we passed through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. So they said the land devours its inhabitants. In other words, one, we cannot take it. Even if we were to take it, it would devour us. And here we have Caleb and Joshua saying that, no, 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 don't be afraid of the people of the land. We will devour them. Powerful. They were willing to fight. You know, all willingness to fight always leads to disloyalty. I have found that some of the most disloyal people in the church are those who are unwilling to fight. Those who are not willing to take extra trouble to do things to get souls saved. Those who just want to be left alone. They are among the most disloyal people. And these 10 spies were disloyal. They led the people into outright rebellion and they suffered for it. You know the consequences of their actions. The other reason why these people were able to exercise such faith is because they saw themselves as victorious. I told you earlier about seeing. This is connected to the first point. They, saw, they said, we will devour them. You know, they, this, the way this is translated into my second land here version in French, it says, nous n'en ferons qu'une bouchée. In other words, we will make mincemeat of them. <laughs> we will make mincemeat of them. I, I, I love that spirit. That's a victorious spirit. You must have that sense of victory. They saw themselves as victorious. They saw their God as powerful. The other people underestimated God and overestimated their opponents. These ones minimized the opposition and the they, they saw the greatness of their God. And so you must despise the, despise the problem and elevate your God if you're going to walk by faith. So as partners, we walk by faith. They were fearless. They had the fear of God, not the fear of man. They honored their leaders. They trusted their leaders and they were willing to obey their leaders at the cost of their lives. But they knew that they would not die. So we, if we're going to conclude this whole matter, what is the conclusion of the matter? That you are to partner with God. Partner with God by faith. Choose to trust him. Whatever the project you're involved in in your local church, believe. Bring your faith to the table. Don't be a skeptic. There is no room for skeptics in the kingdom. Do you know what happened to these men who didn't believe and to the whole group of Israelites who didn't believe? They perished in the wilderness. God said, how long will these people despise me? You know, that's one of the passages that really hit me in the scriptures. God feels that unbelief is despising him. And I, I can see why. Because if you're basically saying, God, you're not able, forget it. You can do it. This situation is too much for you. That's what you say when you don't believe God. And so we need to walk on our faith and, and know that as partners, we must trust God. All the people that we know 
who have done great and mighty things are people who dared to believe that God was able to do it. Not only able to do it, but able to do it through them. This generation will miss its destiny if it does not believe God. That generation missed its way lost out completely because they did not believe God. And, and God is holding us responsible for the fulfillment of his purposes in our generation. It is up to us. He has decided what he's going to do. And he's saying, partner with me, trust me, and take the necessary steps so that my will will be done. That generation was judged severely because they would not partner with God. I want to invite you today. Let us partner with the Lord. Let us trust him. Let us go out there and do things. He gives us good reason to trust him. See, all those people who died in the wilderness, they had a track record of unbelief. And he said about them, he says, none of the men who have seen my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tested me these 10 times and did not obey me will ever see the land I swore to give their fathers. There is a reason why some people are successful in serving the Lord and some are not. I'm not talking about apparent success. I'm talking about the success that God validates, what God calls successful. And it is always tied to their embracing his vision, embracing his purpose and trusting in his goodness and trusting in his power. And the Lord say he was tired of those people. Beloved, let us not be those who provoke God. May the Lord not be tired of you. This is not about, am I going to heaven? This is not about, am I saved by grace? We are saved by grace, but you can be saved by grace and still displease God. You can be saved by grace and still not fulfill your purpose and your destiny. You can be saved by grace and still not be a partner and still be of no use to God whatsoever. I pray that that will not be your, your story. I pray that your testimony would be that the Lord saved you and you made your life available to him that he was able to transform people, transform your generation through your life because you trusted him. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord bless you. And I'll see you next week. Shalom. Hello YouTube, this is Pastor Paul Algidengbe and I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel. I hope you're blessed by the wonderful content that we put out. God bless you. Oh, and rush to the blog also and subscribe and get your free ebook. Bye.